Hello everyone. This is our third and last lecture for chapter two. In this lecture, we will focus on measures of variability, the range, the variance, and standard deviation. Remember that there are three things we want to know about a set of data. Its shape, its typical value, or measures of central tendency, and its spread of scores, or measures of variability. We've already looked at how to describe the shape of distributions and how to calculate and interpret measures of central tendency. The purpose of measures of central tendency is to describe the typical value of a variable. Measures of central tendency, however, can be misleading by themselves because you could have two distributions with the same mean but one of the distributions scores might be more clustered together than the other distributions scores so we need measures of variability as well it's not enough to report the mean of our data values we also need to describe how spread out our data values are how much variation is there within our data set is there lots of variation between data values or is there very little variation? As you can see here, the distribution for height has less variability. The scores are clustered together. The distribution for weight has more variability. The scores are more spread out. Variation always exists in a data set, regardless of which characteristic you're measuring, because not every individual is going to have the same exact value for every variable. Variability is what makes the field of statistics what it is. For example, the price of homes varies from house to house, from year to year, and from state to, to state. Household income varies from household to household, from country to country, and from year to year. Variability can be defined in several ways. Variability is a quantitative measure of the difference between scores Variability describes the degree to which scores are spread out or clustered together. The purpose of measures of variability is to, one, describe the distribution in terms of average distance between scores and means, two, measure how well an individual score represents the distribution, and three, how much error to expect when using a sample. So let's start our discussion on measures of variability with the range. The simplest way to measure variability or spread is to look at the largest and smallest values. This gives us information about the tails of the distribution. The range is the difference between the largest and the smallest data values. The largest data value is also referred to as the maximum and the smallest data value is referred to as the minimum. So let's look at an example of 10 psychology students exam scores 82, 77, 90, 71, 62, 68, 74, 84, 94, and 88. The highest test score is 94, and the lowest test score is 62. The range, R, is equal to 94 minus 62, which is equal to 32. The difference between the best and worst score is 32 points. The range is affected by outliers or extreme values in the data set, so the range is not resistant to outliers. 
If the student with the worst score of 62 actually didn't study and scored even lower, a 28, the range becomes 94 minus 28, which is equal to 66. The difference between the best and worst score here is 66 points. Also, the range is calculated using only two values in the data set, the largest and the smallest. Researchers rarely use the range because it's a very crude way of describing variability since it only considers two scores from the group of scores and it does not take into account how clustered together the scores are within the distribution. The variance and the standard deviation, on the other hand, use all the data values in the calculations. Measures of variability are meant to describe how spread out data are. Another way to think about this is to describe how far, on average, each observation is from the mean. The standard deviation of a group of scores tells us how spread out the scores are around the mean. To be precise, the standard deviation is a measure of the standard or average distance from the mean. Just as there is a population mean and sample mean, we also have a population standard deviation and variance and a sample standard deviation and variance. The calculations are different for population and sample data. Here are the steps to calculate the population standard deviation. If we don't know what the mean is, our first order of business is going to be to calculate the mean for the variable of interest. Next, we're going to subtract the mean from each score. This gives each score's deviation score. The deviation score is how far away the actual score is from the mean. The distance separating a score from the mean is called the score's deviation, indicating the amount the score deviates from the mean. Take each data value and subtract the mean from it. So that's x minus mu for population mean. If the deviation is positive, then the raw score is larger than the mean. If the deviation is negative, then the raw score is less than the mean. The size of the deviation, regardless of its sign, indicates the distance the raw score lies from the mean. This means that the larger the deviation, the further the score is away from the mean. A deviation of zero means that the raw score equals the mean. The sum of the deviations in this step always equals zero. Since the sum of the deviations is always zero, the mean deviation or average distance will always be zero. So we need a new strategy to calculate the average deviation or distance. So the next step is to square each of the deviation scores. This gives each score's squared deviation score. So it's x minus mu, which is the deviation score, squared. Once we've squared each deviation score, we then add up the squared deviations. This total is called the sum of squared deviations. The formula is sum of squares, or SS, equal to sigma, open parentheses, x minus mu, close parentheses, squared. The sum of squared deviations is also known as sum of squares, or SS for short. The next step is to divide the sum of squared deviations, or SS, by the number of scores. This gives us the average of the squared deviations called the variance. As you see, 
along the way to calculating population standard deviation, we get the population variance. Population variance equals mean squared distance or average squared distance of the scores from the population mean. Population variance measures variability in squared units. The formula for population variance is sigma equal to sum of squares divided by the number of scores. Why do we square the deviation scores? Well, first, squaring each difference makes them all positive numbers. Remember, the sum of the deviations is always equal to zero. If we did not square the deviations, then we would always divide zero by the number of scores. Second, it also makes the bigger differences stand out. For example, 100 squared is equal to 10,000. This is a lot bigger than 50 squared, which is equal to 2,500. And third, squaring the differences make the final answer really big and harder to understand. It is difficult to interpret because it is measured in squared units. However, variance plays a really important role in statistical inference, as you will see in later chapters. Remember that the goal here is to calculate a measure of the standard or average distance of the scores from the mean. So the next step is to adjust for having squared all the differences by taking the square root of the variance. The standard deviation is the positive square root of variance. Now there are two ways to calculate the sum of squares, the numerator of the variance and standard deviation formulas. One way is what I just covered, where we calculate each deviation score, square each of the deviations, and then add up the deviation scores. This is the definitional formula for sum of squares. All textbooks, all of the textbooks use this formula. However, there is an easier way to calculate sum of squared, sum of squares, called the computational formula. This formula leads to less calculation errors. The first step is to square each score and add the squared scores. Next step is to add up the scores, square the sum, and divide it by the number of scores. Then subtract your answer in the second step from your answer in the first step. The formula is sum of squares equal to sigma open parentheses x squared close parentheses minus open parentheses sigma x close parentheses squared divided by n. Remember that this is just the numerator of the formula and not the final answer for variance and standard deviation. We would still need to finish the calculation and divide sum of squares by n to find the average squared distance from the mean or the variance and standard deviation. I will show you both of these formulas in action so you can see the difference between the two. Let's take Let's take a simple example and work through the steps of the definitional formula. Suppose you have a population with four numbers, one, three, five, and seven. Step one, find the mean. So one plus three plus five plus seven divided by four is equal to 16 divided by four, which is equal to four. Step two, subtract the mean from each number, one minus four, equal to negative 3. 3 minus 4 equal to negative 1. 5 minus 4 equal 1. 7 minus 4 equals 3. To double check your math in this step, the sum of the deviations is equal to 0. Step 3, square each deviation. So negative 3 squared equals 9. Negative 1 squared equals 1, 
1 squared equals 1, 3 squared equals 9. Step 4, add up the results from step 3. So 9 plus 1 plus 1 plus 9 is equal to 20. This is our sum of squares. Step 5, divide the sum of squares by n. So 20 divided by 4 equals 5. This is our population variance. Step 6, take the square root of 5. It's equal to 2.2361. This is our population standard deviation sigma. The interpretation for this population parameter sigma for, from our data set of 1, 3, 5, and 7 is that the average distance of the scores from the mean is 2.2 points. Notice how many calculations are needed here and how many ways to make calculation errors. Now let's take this same example and work through the steps of the computational formula. Step 1. Square each score and add the squared scores. So 1 squared equals 1, 3 squared equals 9, 5 squared equals 25, 7 squared equals 49. Add up the results. 1 plus 9 plus 25 plus 49 equals 84. Step 2. Add up the scores, square the sum, and divide it by the number of scores. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 is equal to 16. Square the sum, 16 squared equals 256, and divide the result by the number of scores. 256 divided by 4 equals 64. Step 3, subtract your answer in the second step from your answer in the first step. 84 minus 24 equals 22. As you can see, we get the same sum of squares with less calculations and less ways to make calculation errors. So the next two steps are the same as the definitional formula, where population variance is 5, and the population standard deviation is 2.2. One of the goals of inferential statistics is to draw conclusions about the population based on limited information from a sample. Samples are different from populations. Samples have less variability and, cal and calculating sample variance and standard deviation in the same way that we do for a population would result in a biased estimate of the population parameters. We want our sample statistics to be unbiased estimates for the population parameters. In order to remove this bias, we will need to divide our sum of squares by n minus 1 instead of n, or instead of nu. For sample variance and sample standard deviation, the sum of squares is calculated in the same way as before, so the numerator stays the same. Our denominator is the only thing that changes here. The denominator changes from new number of scores to n minus 1. Using our previous example, so now we're looking at sample data of 1, 3, 5, and 7, Remember that our sum of squares was equal to 20. This does not change because our sum of squares using our previous example, so now we're looking at sample data of 1, 3, 5, and 7. Remember that our sum of squares was equal to 20. This does not change because the numerator of our formulas do not change from population to sample. What changes is our denominator. So now, to calculate sample variance, we need to divide sum of squares by n minus 1. So 20 divided by 4 minus 1 is equal to 20 divided by 3, which is equal to 6.6667. This is our sample variance s squared. To calculate sample standard deviation, we take the square root of 6.6667, and that gives us 2.58. This 
is our sample standard deviation, S. The interpretation for this sample statistic, S, from our data set of 1, 3, 5, and 7, is that the average distance of the scores from the mean is 2.6 points. Standard deviation can be difficult to interpret as a single number on its own. Basically, a small standard deviation means that the values in the data set are close to the middle of the data set on average, while a large standard deviation means that the values in the data set are further away from the middle on average. Why does this matter? Another goal of inferential statistics is to detect meaningful and significant patterns in our data. Variability in the data influences how easy it is to see these patterns. High variability hides the patterns that we would be able to see in low variability samples. So we want small standard deviations in our sample data. Small standard deviations represent low variability. Think of low variability and small standard deviations as scores that are closely clustered around their mean, which will make it easier for us to find meaningful patterns in our data. We have just completed Chapter 2. Again, lots of information to take in. Remember to practice the calculations and think about the logic of each formula. This will help you remember which formula to use when. Make sure to complete the Top Hat homework for both Chapters 1 and 2. I've also assigned lab number two. It's a sample quiz to help you practice the concepts you have learned and has similar questions to the proctored, proctored quiz for chapters one and two. Let me know if you have any questions. You can always click on the Canvas chat to see if I'm online and send me a quick message.